Good morning, everyone. Last week, Tom kicked off our new sermon series, looking at the practice of prayer. The focus was on talking to God. And this week, before we delve into the intricacies of our prayer life in more depth, we are going to focus entirely on our attitude to prayer. Just how should we come to God in prayer? Well, I guess the title of this sermon gives a very strong clue. We are to come to God in awe and reverence. And we just had a great example of this in our reading, haven't we? On Mount Horeb, Moses encountered God within the burning bush. And at God's command, he removed his sandals and covered his face. Moses realised that the fire was an image of God's holiness and glory. And taking off his shoes was an act of reverence, conveying his own unworthiness before God. Covering his face, turning his face away, showed that Moses understood that he was not fit to stand in front of his awesome God. Yet, we're in a position today, aren't we, to look back on this event with the knowledge of what was to come. In verse 7, God says to Moses that he has seen the misery of his people in Egypt and he has come to rescue them. Though God revealed himself as the one who lives in unapproachable light, the burning bush symbolises his intent not to consume or destroy his people, but to be their saviour. This, they would be led out of bondage in Egypt and into the promised land. And eventually God would send his only son, Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross for us, he took away all our unholiness, exchanging his righteousness for our unrighteousness. When we believe in God, when we believe him and accept him as holy, then we can approach his throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we come to the one who has both limitless power and perfect love. When our daughters were still at high school, they'd not been in the house for five minutes before they were arguing about who should go on the landline first to phone the friends that they'd just left at the bus stop. Of course, This was before the days of young people having mobile phones. It seemed that they enjoyed the company of their friends so much, well, most of the time, that even when they'd been with them all day in school, they just couldn't wait to get back in contact with them again. I would say that our prayer life should be like this. We should always be anticipating the next time that we are going to be connecting with our awesome God. However, there is one important difference. We do not have an equal relationship with God, as our girls did with their friends. Although there are verses from Scripture that speak of friendship with God, for example, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. But even so, God's desire to be friends with us does not equate to us treating him as we would our ordinary human friends. Instead, we must begin by never forgetting that God is God. He is the one and only God who is absolutely righteous, holy, timeless, almighty, the builder of everything, the unfailing ruler of heaven and earth. Where you get the picture, we come to our God in prayer because he has, because we have been enabled to draw close to him because of Jesus. But we also come with awe and reverence because of his majesty. Because we are aware of his power, his holiness 
and his sovereignty over all things. God can be our closest friend in the guise of Jesus, but he is also our cosmic ruler. Let's take a look at the words reverence and awe as we focus on this attitude to prayer. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, reverence has been defined as a deep respect or admiration for someone. It's in complete contrast to irreverence that reaffirms a perspective that only answers to itself and encourages others to stay away. Awe is a reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder. It's not a fear that should make us afraid of God. Far from it but one that marvels at his greatness and majesty and leads us to love him and obey his will for us. In reverent awe, we recognise that God is beyond our understanding, yet intimately involved in our lives. It's his reverence that sets the foundation for our relationship with him. In Psalm 33, verse 8, it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. So starting our time of prayer with awe for God means approaching him with a deep sense of respect and admiration. It's about recognising our own smallness in the presence of his greatness. Imagine standing at the edge of a majestic mountain range or gazing up at a star-filled sky. In those moments, a sense of awe and wonder often washes over us, doesn't it? It leaves us humbled and in awe of God's handiwork. It's this same awe that we should bring into our prayer life as we connect with him. By starting with all, we position ourselves to receive the wisdom that only God could give us. Our fear of the Lord becomes a catalyst for growth, transformation and a deeper love and respect for him. Last week, Tom reminded us that Jesus himself taught us that we must properly reverence God. He taught the disciples to begin their prayers with, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means set apart as holy. Timothy Keller in his book Prayer writes, to hallow God's name is to have a heart of grateful joy toward God. And even more, a wondrous sense of his beauty. So as we treat the name of God with reverence and as we come before him in prayer, It is good to picture ourselves as being filled with some of this beauty and tenderness. Significantly, this request from Jesus to hallow God's name comes at the start of the Lord's Prayer. It's of primary importance to God that we hallow his name. Also, it removes the focus from us, doesn't it? And turns our complete attention to God. It's completely about him, his holiness, and his work in the world. John Calvin described reverence as the place where joy and fear are held together. Not the fear of trembling and despair, but the kind that cultivates awe and respect when contemplating God's holiness, nearness, grace, and power. This kind of reverence does not invite worshippers into what C.S. Lewis has called an obligation to feel, but into a space where personal feelings serve only as a background to the drama of God's being. It's very easy, isn't it, to find reasons not to pray. We get distracted maybe by smartphones, other technology, people noise, other things that we make a priority over God's. We think we are too busy to pray sometimes, or we have a sense that we could be doing something else. Another issue, dare I say it, is boredom. Sadly, if we've grown up in church, we can also see it as a routine thing to do. We lose the excitement 
and the anticipation of drawing close to God. As Tom also said last week, it can be like eating our vegetables. We know it's good for our health, but few of us enjoy it. Prayer, indeed, can become an obligation rather than a delight. So let's dig a bit deeper into just how we can connect our minds and souls and come to God in awe and reverence. Did anyone choose Psalm 46 for the homework that Tom set us last week? Did you do the homework? (laughs) In verse 10, the Lord speaks in the first person. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This is a call for us to stop. The word still is a translation of the Hebrew word rapa, meaning to slacken or cease. It's not just about quietness, but a letting go of frantic activity, and by then acknowledging God's status as all-knowing, all-powerful and ever-present. We are then in a position to surrender ourselves completely to him in prayer. We need to stop and let go of all the stuff in our lives, and maybe upgrade our view of God as well. It can help to focus for a minute or two on the true characteristics of God identified in Scripture. The delight God takes in us, how he cares about the smallest details of our lives, how he is patient with and understanding of our weaknesses and failures, how he wants to help us out of the messes that we get ourselves into, how he likes to hear what we think and what we feel. We can also sing a chorus or rattle off a list of things we're grateful for to God or praise God with specific things we love about him. So we stop. And as we remind ourselves that we are coming into the presence of God, we let ourselves anticipate the warmth of the most important relationship we will ever have. We let ourselves be caught up in it. The year before my father died, he was absolutely desperate to have a family holiday with us all. I won't go into the details, but suffice to say, it was a major undertaking to make this desire a reality as he was quite disabled by that time of his life. Despite the effort required from all the family, all ten of us, including hoisting Dad, washing him, pushing his wheelchair over the sands, the joy of being in his presence was immeasurable. Being present with someone we love is never a waste of time. And so this must be the case in our relationship with God as well. If our priority is a relationship with God, then we have to make the effort to engage with him. And just as the relationship with another human develops, the more we are in their presence, so our relationship with God will mature the more we touch base with him. As Jesus promised, the fruit will grow if we remain attached to the vine. I would be the first to say that it's not always easy connecting our minds and souls and coming to God in awe and reverence. When Sai assigned me this talk, I did feel unsure whether I could speak about it authentically. When I read the associated Bible reading, Exodus 3, I could immediately see it as an example of awe and reverence. But was that all there was to it? No. Now, as I took a closer look at the story of Moses and the burning bush, I began to see how this story can really help us all to turn prayer from a duty and an obligation to something that is pure delight. Let's go back to the story once more. It begins inauspiciously enough. Moses is tending his sleep in Midian, his sheep in Midian, minding his own business living his everyday life, when something quite bizarre intrudes upon him. On Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, he 
God. He sees a burning bush on fire, yet it doesn't burn up. Unlike every other flame, this one uniquely does not depend on the bush for fuel. So it does not consume it, but it's somehow transcendently present within it. The whole thing is remarkable, but it's particularly significant. Particularly significant that God appears as fire, not to repel, but to attract Moses, to cause him to draw near to him and to call him by name. Yes, Moses understands he is on holy ground and hides his faith. But God then invites Moses into the intimacy of personal relation, of communion, of the exchanging of names. So the third point I want to make this morning is that as we stop and as we anticipate, we also appreciate just whose company we are coming into. The image of the burning bush helps us to understand the one we are praying to, the God who made himself known to Moses as flame, wants to hold our gaze too. He is concerned about our suffering. He wants to rescue us from adversity and bring us to a place flowing with milk and honey. God called himself I am, a name describing his eternal power and unchangeable nature. In the world today, where values, morals and laws change in just the same way that they did in Moses' time, we can come to him in delight, aware of the security and stability found in our unchanging God, aware that we can do nothing without him. It's not so much about fathoming God out, but immersing ourselves in his presence so willingly available to us. I think that this talk presents a challenge to us that can be simply summed up with a question. We are supposed to pray, but do we really want to? Is it our heart's desire? If we want to, then our God is always there. He may be there, obviously, as in the burning bush, or very quietly, but he won't let us down. We just need to turn up, lay aside our busyness and preoccupation with self, and let God be God. John Pritchard, in his book, How to Pray, provides a lovely image of what prayer is all about. Is based on the parable of the man who built his house upon the rock. When we pray, it's as if we are putting down spiritual boreholes. At first, they go into sand, which is often what our prayer feels like to begin with. Nothing solid, a waste of time, lost maybe in our own meanderings. But as we keep going down, we eventually hit rock which is where Jesus told us to build our foundations on God himself. However, as we keep putting the borehole deeper and deeper, we come to the level of molten rock, which shoots up the borehole and catches us by surprise. Just like Moses experienced the burning bush, so it is with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. God is not only solid rock, he's also powerful energetic and life-giving, and he can surprise us with the force of his presence. Our task in prayer then is to keep putting the borehole down through our human weaknesses, the sands, and into the reality of God, the rock, eventually getting through to the surprises of the spirit, the molten rock, where God comes shooting to the surface and we are caught up for a moment and the, in the joy and the wonder of his divine life. In this age of instant communication, we expect prompt replies, don't we? Replies that can be abrupt sometimes and easily misinterpreted. This is not God's communication strategy. Prayer is so much more than asking for things. Through prayer, we can experience the transformative power of God's love in our lives. 
Coming to God in a state of reverence is an act of our love and respect, demonstrating our devotion and trust in the one who holds our past, our present, and the future in his hands. God wants us to spend time with him and to trust him. He wants us to have an intimate encounter with the voice from the flame. Let's pray, shall we?